So welcome everyone. We will hold a Q&A session today about learning mathematics in general and using space repetition. Our guest is Paul Raymond Robichaud. Paul has been using space repetition to learn math for the past eight years. He has a bachelor in math, a doctorate in computer science, and he is currently a mathematician doing research in quantum foundations. Thank you very much, Paul, for joining us and asking and answering our questions. Thanks a lot, Nicola, and thanks for having accepted to moderate the event. I also want to thank uh, Guillaume for uh, recording and editing uh, the event, and uh, Jake for helping with curating questions. Um, and I want to thank everyone in the Discord the community uh, for uh, that came here to participate to the event. Uh, you're helping to create this. Um, and uh, today we'll do mostly uh, question and answers. I, I know that some of you would like to see my material, but I don't think we'll have the time today. But what I will do is I will soon do a, a stream of myself uh, doing uh, my, my practice of space repetitions. And another thing that I will do uh, soon too is uh, show you a complete example of how I, I memorize a proof, definition, and theorems. So I'll probably select a very elementary uh, mathematical theorem and uh, show you how to memorize the related definition, the proof, how to decompose the proof, and uh, so we'll have a practical example. So today we'll focus on the question and answer. And another thing I will do soon is I will participate uh, in a podcast uh, with uh, Guillem. Um, I, I think uh, that's it. Thank you, Paul. We really appreciate that uh, you want to do this public learning with us. For the viewers watching us on YouTube, we invite you to join our Discord community to the link we will post in the description. Here we discuss everything about learning, and in particular, about learning without coercion, learning with space repetition, and learning with SuperMemo software. We'll start the Q&A with questions sent by community, and if we have time, we'll go to more questions. So feel free to uh, ask questions in the thread or in the chat here and Jake will um, select some questions for Paul. Uh, the first question from the community is, uh, what is your opinion on doing exercise and problem sets from books? Can this be considered free learning? Uh, that's an excellent question. And uh, most textbooks are, are books that I've created for a certain course. So we need to distinguish between problems that come for, from an outside source or are through non-free learning and uh, prompts that come uh, from yourself. And in the case of prompt sets from books, these tend to be problems uh, that are there to help you pass uh, an exam. Uh, so uh, for instance, if you take a linear algebra book, it might uh, tell you, uh, it might give you 40 uh, three by three matrices and uh, tell you to compute the determinant. This is completely uh, bland and uh, meaningless. And the only reason people do uh, th this kind of drill is, is that uh, they will have an exam uh, later where they will be asked a similar question and uh, uh, they will uh, have to train themselves to do these things. And it's not very useful for you. Uh, it's not really useful uh, for, for anyone to do these things except to pass these exams. So I don't really uh, recommend them. Uh, however, uh, in the course of your life as a mathematician, you will come across a wide variety of problems that do not come from, from books and that, that come from your, your own interest. You, you see something and you start to be curious about it. And then uh, you start to think about the answers. The, these are the best problems to answer. They, they don't come from sets. They, they don't come externally. They come internally. And, and this has the highest value possible. Uh, okay. Thank you, Paul. And um, the second question is, is it optimal to approach math by any order or is it better to follow a traditional academic order with a bit of flexibility to address curiosity along the way? So, uh, to answer that question, I, I need to think a bit about, uh, to discuss a bit about the, the academic order. When, when you do a bachelor in math, uh, for instance, uh, you will first learn uh, calculus, then you learn uh, analysis, uh, which is a, a more uh, rigorous understanding of calculus. And then you will do topology, which is an abstraction of uh, uh, the concept you've seen in analysis. And yet, uh, my perspective is that 
it's not exactly the, the right order. This order has been created uh, perhaps because it's the easiest to uh, in a mass classroom. But uh, the, the, the reality is that um, when you want to learn something in math, your understanding and your uh, the, the order you should do it depends on your own prior knowledge and your prior interest. Uh, you might already be ready for things that are not exactly in your book. So uh, the, the best way to learn mathematics is uh, in the, the order that gives the greatest value possible to you. And that, that order is right. It's an internal order uh, rather than an external order. It's the order where you choose what you should be uh, learning rather than something that has been imposed. The, the fact that there's an academic order uh, come because the academic world has a certain set of problems that it's trying to solve. It's trying to uh, mass produce uh, diplomas and to mass produce uh, the, the certification of your knowledge. It's not made uh, for a person that is trying to learn independently. Such a person does not uh, is not concerned or fettered by, by these bonds. These bonds are utterly artificial and are not uh, really useful. So the, the proper order for learning mathematics is uh, contingent upon your prior knowledge, upon your interest, and the academic order uh, completely uh, ignore these things. And moreover, uh, the, the books frequently uh, tend to be, uh, I'll discuss this later uh, because there, there's a smart question uh, later. So I think we'll stop here for this question. Okay, so the next question is from GC Room. He asked, do you tend to make close deletion cards from already existing text or you create them from scratch? So uh, I, I create everything from scratch. Uh, there, there are many reasons. Uh, the fact is that uh, a text that has been created by someone else uh, often uh, is not ideal because uh, you might have knowledge which is different from the knowledge of the author. Uh, so in mathematics, you might know uh, different tools, and uh, th these tools would lead you to have a completely different formulation of the knowledge. Uh, you, you might see a proof that has been written by someone else, and you think, uh, wait a minute, th this proof uh, could be made much simpler because I know uh, other aspects of uh, another mathematical theory, and th these tools could help me. And uh, th the fact is that the way we formulate uh, knowledge uh, depends on our own prior knowledge, on our own understanding of the situation. Uh, it And uh, a text written by someone else, if you uh, just copy and paste it or memorize it as it is, uh, has very little value. It will not be as uh, semantical, if you will. Moreover, uh, I read less and less texts from uh, other people because the more knowledge you have in math, uh, through space repetition, the more you're able to generate your own ideas. So at this point, uh, it's almost 1% uh, of uh, uh, looking at other texts and 99% of uh, creating my own ideas. The more you know, the more you're able to create entirely on your own. The more you have tools inside you, the more you're able to prove theorems on your own. The more uh, you understand about various theorems and theories, the more you're able to construct theories almost entirely from scratch. Of course, in the beginning, you can't quite do that, and that is fine. But you will realize that as you progress, more and more of what you're creating uh, comes from uh, within. Uh, because mathematics, contrary to other uh, uh, science, is not empirical. It doesn't depend on the, the state of the external world. Uh, mathematics uh, is created through something called the uh, axiomatic systems. And from the the axioms of an axiomatic system, in theory, you could uh, prove in your room alone everything that is interesting. Of course, you will not be able to do it, but uh, ju just the fact that it is possible, contrary to other science, leads to a widely different process. Thank you, Paul. Uh, the next question by GC Room is, uh, how can I use space repetitions to get a taste of a bunch of fields of math and find a specific subfield that I like the most? Uh, it's very easy. All you have to do is to follow your own interest, uh, memorize the, the, the things you find interesting in math, and you will quickly 
realize what your true interests are. Because when you're not in a setting where you're coerced to, to learn some things, to get a diploma or something like that, you will gravitate toward your interests naturally. So in my own case, uh, I've realized that uh, very naturally, I memorize a lot of algebra, a lot of uh, foundation of mathematics, and uh, almost no geometry. And I, I had never thought that much about that, that uh, I have a strong preference for, for this, or, or it was never that explicit. The topics you like will emerge naturally uh, and very quickly. The, the more you do it, the, the more you will see uh, what you truly enjoy. And the next question is from Walter. Um, he said, I've got an approximate model of how you go about proofs, though I might be wrong. And I think it might be in tension with what uh, Michael Nielsen says. Uh, he quoted, people inexperienced at mathematics sometimes memorize proofs as linear lists of statements. A more useful way is to think of proofs as interconnected networks of simple observations. Things are rarely true for just one reason. Finding multiple explanations for things give you an improved understanding. What do you think oh. about that? That's a great question. Just because a proof uh, is a, a certain list of statement uh, where, uh, which justify a, a theorem and tell you that the theorem is true uh, doesn't mean that a proof is without explanation or also doesn't mean that, that a theorem has a single explanation. So there, there's absolutely no contradiction with the fact that the proof is a list of statement and the, the the fact that there might be several proof for a statement, hence several explanation, and that it's not the exact list of statements that matters, but rather you have to think in terms of the hypothesis uh, that, that justify the statement, and you have to think about how these things are connected between each other. Uh, but yet, memorizing the, the proof and memorizing proof in a clear way that, that make all these hypotheses explicit might be the best way to have an understanding of uh, theorems. Uh, for, for instance, when you memorize a list uh, of statements, uh, human memory is extremely associative. We think about the why, else it's extremely hard to memorize. You're able to memorize it precisely because you see the link between the statements, precisely because you know what rules and tools are being used, precisely because uh, a proof is, uh, connect the, the knowledge of math is connected with a lot of other knowledge. So there, there's not much of a contradiction between uh, memorizing list uh, of statements as long as you do it semantically, as long as you learn uh, before you memorize, as long as you only memorize things that you have understood, uh, then all these connections will be more and more uh, explicit within your mind and you will be uh, able to create an extremely large network of interconnected ideas. And this is my goal when I memorize these proofs. Um, the next question is from Guillermo Palau. He asked, how do you make a generalization of a math problem? Um, that's an extremely uh, interesting question. There's two answers. There's an easy one and a hard answer. The, the easy one is uh, quite simply, uh, you start with a mathematical theorems. And uh, for every hypothesis that the theorem contained, you look at whether the hypothesis was really essential or not. And this might happen uh, very, very often. And every time you see an inessential hypothesis, you remove it. And by doing so, uh, you have created a more general statement. I, I will give a, a simple example for, for the people in the audience. Uh, here's a, a theorem. 3 plus 2 is equal to 2 plus 3. Uh, there's something... This statement can be generalized into uh, a, a certain number A and another number B. Uh, have the property that a plus b is equal to b plus a. And th this is true for the real number, the complex numbers. It's true uh, even if a or b were matrices, uh, for, for instance. And uh, so, so we, we started with a very particular statement, and we realized that uh, the fact that we were dealing with 2 and 3 was absolutely uh, inessential. And it's mostly about regarding what was the, what were the core feature. Uh, but an important, the, the hard question is most, or, or the, the something a bit more hard and, and much more interesting is the fact that sometimes a certain proof might require all hypotheses. 
and it's not possible to remove any hypothesis. So a proof is more general when I remove a hypothesis. Then it means that the proof applies in more case, in more general setting. And uh, sometimes I might not be able to remove a single of the hypothesis, but that's because the proof I use uh, was not the most general proof possible. And then it is much harder, and there, there's not an explicit process to, to generalize the proof of, of the statement. Uh, then uh, it's extremely helpful to have more and more mathematical tools that reside with, within you. The more tools you know, the more you'll be able to conjure and think about new principle and new way to formulate the proof in a way that uh, does not uh, use the, the, the previous hypothesis uh, you were using. So th there's not an exact process. Uh, I would just say try to have more knowledge, try to think about the proof, try to find a new way but uh, the question you're asking me is a bit, how do you do creative mathematics? Uh, th this is a question that uh, I, I, I don't think I can give you a, a full answer uh, in this short uh, question and answer. But that was a great question. Um, there is another question by Guillaume. He asked, uh, why are math textbooks usually bad? What sources do you recommend to learn math? And what is your favorite textbook and why? Okay, um, so the, the first, uh, there are three questions. The first one is, why are math textbooks usually bad? And there, there are two different aspects of that. Uh, the, the first aspect is that most math textbooks are uh, textbooks uh, that uh, are, were created for a certain course. So uh, you have a book uh, for a course in linear algebra, uh, uh, in a, a certain university setting. And because it's created for in a university setting, it tends to be uh, self-contained. For for instance, your, your mad book on linear algebra uh, in first year might not contain anything about group theory. Th despite the fact that group theory uh, is, is essential to understand uh, a linear algebra, it, it might uh, be restricted to the case of linear algebra over real numbers. and it creates a lot of unnecessary restriction just because it needs to be extremely self-contained. Uh, it's made for people that uh, have been able to meet a certain set of prerequisite, and uh, it's not made uh, for uh, uh, it's made for such a specific audience in a self-contained way. But mathematics itself is not self-contained. In mathematics, all the fields are related to each other, and by creating the, these course where things are are not allowed to be related we miss a huge uh, section of the, the true nature of mathematics. And uh, that is not the, the proper way to, to learn mathematics. So the, the first reason that's that many of these textbooks are, are simply uh, curriculum textbooks, and they, they suffer from academic constraints that are not a constraint that you, you, you need when you're studying on your own. They, they're not useful. Uh, and as I discussed previously, they're full of exercises that are just uh, created for the purpose of passing your exams and that could rarely contain anything uh, new or interesting. They are, they are artificial. And uh, so th that's the first reason why uh, mathematical uh, textbooks are often not very good. And there's another reason. And the, the problem uh, is that even if a book is very good, doesn't suffer from the, these flaws, uh, it is still a book. And a, a book uh, is a, a piece uh, of technology uh, which suffers from a variety of problems. Contrary to uh, an internet text, it doesn't have uh, hyperlinks. It's not easy to correct a book. If a new proof is discovered for a statement, uh, a book cannot be corrected right away. Uh, you will have to wait a new edition. The person might not realize uh, that uh, the knowledge uh, is there. Uh, so it, it suffers from all these uh, these prompts, uh, and just from the point of view of uh, information theory, one property of information is that you should be able to uh, to shift its state, and it's very hard to to do shift to to a book. It's not that uh, uh, I, I can't update it for that easily. Well, uh, you can uh, easily update a, a wiki page. So a wiki page is editable. Uh, it is. Uh, uh, possible to add more and more links, and thus uh, it it end up being uh, not as good as uh, what the internet often can offer. And it doesn't come with search engine as powerful as Google. So one one problem is that textbook 
uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, try uh, to solve the, the problem of giving diploma to people and it come with constraints you don't need. And the other problem is simply that it's book. But still, there, there might be good books. And just because they're technological problems doesn't mean I am uh, against books. Uh, it merely means that uh, uh, we also have access to a new kind of technology that, that offer improvements. So I, I, I still like book books. Uh, so what source do I recommend? Uh, well, I still recommend books, uh, uh, preferably not textbooks, preferably uh, books that are written for uh, specialists that don't need to pass exams, that don't need to follow a curriculum, but that do uh, need to do research or that are curious about a certain topic. I highly recommend Wikipedia. I think I'll discuss Wikipedia later. Uh, it is in the, the list of questions. Uh, I recommend websites, uh, articles, but I don't recommend reading all these things in a linear way. The, the, the way to go is to uh, find the information you find interesting for the, and that will help you to solve the problems or increase the, the understanding of the things you care about. Do, I do not read books in a linear order. I read uh, mathematical books or website uh, to find the information I need and then I think about it and then I create the proof that I need and that, that expands my knowledge uh, at the first uh, in the direction I, I, I want. And finally, uh, Kilam didn't quite ask the question of what is your favorite textbook and why, but uh, because there were questions about books, I thought uh, I'll add this one because I want to talk about my favorite textbook. Uh, and my favorite textbooks are a series of three books called uh, Fundamental of Mathematics, Volume 1, 2, and 3. I think the first uh, volume is about Foundation of Mathematics, Algebra, and the Real Number System. The, the second book is uh, Geometry, but with some topology. And the third book is about Analysis. And what I liked about these books is that these are not books that were created for course. Uh, they, uh, and because of that, they don't follow the, the traditional order of learning things. Uh, and they... They don't have the problem of uh, having uh, a topic being treated uh, in a self-contained way without reference with uh, the wider uh, aspect of mathematics. They, they relate and interconnect theories in a way that I've rarely seen other books do. Uh, they, they present the most general statement always. Uh, and uh, it, it doesn't contain the, the kind of fluff that most uh, mathematical uh, textbooks have. For instance, mathematical textbooks tend to uh, uh, become bigger and bigger every year uh, with more and more uh, futile exercise just because then they can sell a new edition. So they, they don't even have exercise. I, I spoke against exercise and uh, they don't contain any of that. It is just the, the real thing. And uh, for instance, the, the linear algebra, uh, the, the chapter on group theory is before the, the chapter on linear algebra so that you can use all the results of group theory which makes uh, the algebra much more powerful. And uh, the, the group theory section is uh, before the, the theory of rings and fields, and uh, it's re really well constructed. It, uh, so I highly recommend these books. And uh, when I was uh, doing my bachelor, I, I read them over and over. And that, that was part of my greatest joy uh, of doing mathematics, just to be in front of these books. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for this recommendation, Paul. Uh, we will post the link of the books in the description for those who want to check out. And uh, the next question also um, is a follow-up from your first event that we will post the link to, and I hope uh, the audience will watch it. Um, you propose to uh, chunk the assumptions when formulating proof flashcards. And the question is, how can you chunk them? Wouldn't a chunk assumption flashcard be arbitrary and contextless? So that's an extremely interesting question. So in math, uh, every proof uh, has a certain set of assumptions, like uh, if a certain list of statement is true, then uh, a list A, B, C, D, E of statement is true, then a certain statement F is also true. And uh, the thing about math is that uh, these lists of assumptions are rarely uh, arbitrary because mathematics itself it is not that uh, arbitrary. Mathematics, which is in some sense a theory of structure, has structure, which is an extraordinary fact. In mathematics, uh, some of these lists reoccur more often than other lists. And uh, th these lists define mathematical structure. 
So uh, if I tell you that the statement applies to a real number, it doesn't look like this, but num the real numbers are themselves a certain list of assumptions, namely the, the axioms of real number. So you just say, instead of saying X is a number uh, that belongs to an ordered field, uh, which, uh, uh, which uh, has completeness properties, and uh, you just say uh, X uh, is a real number. So all these, you use yourself chunks of assumptions without realizing it. Uh, if I tell you that a, a theorem uh, is true in a metric space, uh, then it means uh, the theorem is true in a space that contains a metric, which uh, is a, 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 fun a, a distance function, sorry, uh, which has a property that uh, for any two points in the space, uh, the dis x and y, the distance between x and y is equal to the distance between y and x, and that it, uh, the distance is a positive real number, uh, or greater or equal to zero, and that the distance between x and y is uh, equal to zero if and only if x and is equal to y, and that there's a triangle inequality. So I, I've made such a long list of assumptions uh, into a, a very uh, short and meaningful uh, thing by just saying uh, that I'm working in metric space. So every time I... I in math, what we do is we use... Uh, sequence of axioms that reoccur often. The, these are the meaningful chunks. And uh, the, these chunks are not arbitrary. Some of them reoccur much more uh, than others. Uh, and uh, you, you memorize this, uh, you memorize these as constituting uh, axioms or definitions. Uh, and that is the way to go around it. And of course, a theorem might also have a few assumptions that uh, don't quite define a structure and that, that are there for the sake of the theorem, and these you don't really chunk. So, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, the next question is from GC Room, and um, it's the question of Wikipedia that we talked about before. Uh, do you agree that Wikipedia can only ever be an introduction since there are no associated proofs and the explanations can skip over some insights an author typically provides? Um. In some sense, it's true that Wikipedia is only an introduction, uh, but it's an introduction to so many things because there are so many pages on Wikipedia. And for various topics, you only need an introduction uh, because uh, you cannot know uh, every mathematical theory or everything in high details. But moreover, uh, the more you know about math, the more a short introduction uh, has far and wide-ranging consequences, the, the more you can do with little. Uh, for, for instance, in, in my case, I might just see uh, a few uh, ideas on Wikipedia, and it might be enough to reconstruct a huge chunk of uh, mathematical theory, because I, uh, with more and more experience, you, you, you will find naturally what are the natural theorems within this theory. You will know them. You will be able to prove them uh, easily without uh, doing any kind of uh, effort because the knowledge uh, of how to do that is already in your mind. All the theorems you need are already at your fingertip because uh, of all the, the knowledge that is within you. So uh, Wikipedia might just be an introduction but don't underestimate what you can do with an introduction. And moreover, Wikipedia is source, so it will give you a bit of advice of where to go uh, later to find other texts. Um, the next question, I think uh, many people in the audience are interested in, uh, what do you think about using incremental reading for mathematics? Okay, so th there are two aspects to that question. One concerns the, the incremental reading tools that exist, for instance, in uh, Super Memo, where you take a text, you decompose it into subsection, and uh, then you, you, you try to understand only the subsection. And in my case, I find this almost impossible uh, for various reasons. Mathematical texts often use a specialized terminology and that has been introduced for the purpose of that text, they will refer to a, a function called f. But uh, the function f could be any type of function. It's going to be extremely dependent on the type of text that you're reading. In some uh, texts, the function f might be the square function. In another, uh, it might be a, a trigonometric function or something like that. And uh, you will not be able to understand a, a small section of the text. And as I also mentioned previously, uh, 
most of my flashcards I, I generate. Uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned that, but I, I generate them myself using my own thought, using the the, the things I've read, and uh, be, because of that, I'm able to. Uh, it's not really possible to just take a text and uh, read it. I prefer to to work on a problem based approach. I have a certain problem in my head that I'm trying to solve, and uh, I. I find the text I need, uh, or the tools I need online, or using various texts, and I'm concentrated only in solving a certain problem. And for that, I don't think incremental reading is that compatible. But I also do math not really in a linear order, but one problem at a time, and uh, one small part at a time. And in that sense, what I do is incremental. Um, the next question is from uh, MD Kubis. He asked, what kind of mathematics can you use in daily life? How to learn it? Is it, adva is it advanced mathematics useful? Um, so what kind of mathematics can you use in daily life? Uh, there's a little bit. Uh, you certainly don't need the, the full uh, range of... Uh, uh, you don't need to be a professional mathematician, but there, there's quite a few things that might come up. Uh, for instance, if you uh, read... Uh, any kind of article that talks about stats. Uh, 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 for instance, you might be interested in the elections uh, and, and they might talk about a survey. You might want to be able to understand uh, what is being discussed. Uh, what, so you might want to know what is a mean, what is an average, what is a standard deviation. Uh, it's not that advanced, but this knowledge will be useful for understanding the world around you. Or uh, if you uh, take a bank loan, it might be useful to know how to compute an interest rate. Uh, this will allow you to uh, to make better decisions. Uh, if uh, you uh, uh, are in your household, sometimes you need a, a little bit of... Uh, uh, you take medication, you might want to be able to compute that dosage to see if your doctor didn't make an error. Uh, so. There are little things you can use in daily life, but you rarely need advanced mathematics. And, and that's because the, the kind of problems that uh, we try to solve with advanced mathematics uh, are, are much more like collective problems that, that belong to uh, specialized uh, workers. And uh, when you're in daily life, you're trying to solve uh, more general problems that are slightly more mundane and don't require... Uh, that advanced mathematics, it would not be cost effective to do extremely advanced mathematics to solve daily life problems. Uh, so you do need a bit of math, uh, just as you need a bit of chemistry in daily life or a bit of physics. All these things are useful. And my advice for, for people in daily life is that if you see things that might need numbers, uh, it, it might be worth it to try to learn a little bit of math to help you make better decisions. Uh, what about advanced mathematics in daily life? Uh, well, I've never used uh, any kind of advanced mathematics in my own daily life, uh, ever. Uh, the, the, the more advanced mathematics I might use in daily life might be when there, there's a, a game I'm playing uh, uh, and I'm trying to find the, the good strategy and I might think about these things. So uh, maybe it will allow you to uh, understand a board game you're playing with your friends, but it's not that useful and not that important. Uh, yeah. Um, the next question from Winston um, is a follow-up to this one. How can mathematics benefit free learners when there is no relevance? So just because uh, something uh, is not really uh, useful doesn't mean it's not beautiful. If it gives you pleasure to pursue mathematics, uh, you should do it. You, you should follow. Uh, you should not necessarily follow a usefulness criterion in your life, else your life would be very, very boring. Uh, so, some people study uh, science uh, for for the beauty and the joy it provides, even if there there's not necessarily relevance. Uh, for for it's the, for the same reason that people uh, might be interested to visit an art gallery or uh, that uh, they might enjoy a movie. You can view it as something that adds uh, joy in your life and that uh, makes you realize that uh, the, the world is a beautiful place. Um, the next question is from Guillaume. He asks, do you recommend learning latex when it's needed or to build a strong foundation at earlier stages? 
So LaTeX is a software to write mathematical equations. And in my case, uh, I learned it a little bit by a little bit. When I need to do, a, I, I use LaTeX for formulating my flashcards. And essentially, I learned the minimum I need to be able to formulate my flashcards. And uh, then uh, that, that's all I need to do. So if there's a new symbol that I don't know, I will memorize the, the symbol I don't know and use that symbol in a, my new flashcards. And that's it. And that's all. It's much better uh, to think in terms of a prone-based approach where you have problems you're interested in solving and you learn the, the knowledge you need for solving that problem rather than to try to memorize a lot of things you might not even use or need. There might be symbols or things in LaTeX that you'll never use. LaTeX is uh, extremely huge. There are so many packages. You, you can't know them all. So it's better to think in terms of your needs rather uh, than uh, to memorize things in uh, uh, because someone else has created some sort of curriculum. And th this question is generalizable for everything. I, I would recommend a problem-based approach where you just try to learn the knowledge you need for solving the, the question, for understanding the things that interest you rather than uh, follow some sort of curriculum and to uh, so uh, gather the knowledge you need to solve the problems you need and that's all. Next question is from Alex Giorev. He asked, would you create a card for a non-interesting theorem because it's a convenient way to actively recall some useful principle that is applied to prove the theorem? The idea being that you're creating the card for the sake of memorizing the principle to apply it to actually interesting theorems in the future? So the question asked me whether I would memorize a non-interesting theorem because it uses an interesting theorem. In my view is that an interesting theorem is a theorem that can be used to prove many, many uh, interesting theorems, if you will. It's a bit circular, but not completely. Or an interesting problem, uh, uh, yeah. So a theorem is interesting when it can prove many, many facts that I need, then that are relevant. So no, I would never do that. Uh, the next question is from Jake. He asked, why memorize the proofs and not the general ideas? such that you can rederive proofs on demand. I just need to gather my thought. Uh, Take your time, please. Um, let me try this. Uh, so the, the ability to rederive a theorem uh, means that you have incomplete knowledge. You, you might lose details in the, the transition. If uh, you're able to rederive a proof, often it takes a lot more time and you, it, it it's a lot harder. So it doesn't come quite as instantaneously. So when you will need to use the, the proof or the ideas in another theorem, uh, you won't quite be able to do it as quickly. It's a, a bit of the same thing, like why memorize theorem when uh, I could uh, just find them in a book? Well, you, you will not be able to use a theorem if you do not recall it instantaneously. You will not be able to create something new unless it is in your mind. So uh, that, that's why I memorize proof and that's why I memorize their details. You will not remember their details if it is not in your mind and you have not memorized it. Uh, often when I look at theorems or, or proof or definition, I'm able to generalize and to find many, many new ideas. And the reason I'm able to do so is because there are so many ideas already within me. And they're, they're precise, they're very precise in my mind and they're very easy to recall. And the more you know, the more you, you see a statement and you're instantaneously able to, uh, to generate many, many new ideas. But you can only do that if the tools that you use are in your mind and easily accessible. Um, the next question is from Alex Gyorev. How do you select a problem to study? Um, I don't really select prompt to study. I, uh, I, I'm like a kid. If you observe a kid uh, playing, they don't really think deeply about what they want to play uh, or they don't think deeply about what they want to do. They just do it. At some point, they get bored and then it, it's like an inner signal that tells them to, to switch activity. So uh, generally, these prompts that interest me, they, they come very naturally. I get curious about a little something. I start thinking about it. And uh, I learn uh, other things. I get curious about other stuff. And uh, they, they just come very naturally. If I find an idea is uh, makes me curious, I go toward it. And, and that's all. I don't think too deeply the, about these things. I, I just follow my interest and my passion. 
Um, the next question is, how can one identify and correct errors in flashcards? That's an extremely good question. Uh, and the best way to find an error is to know that you have misapplied a certain rule. And the best way to know you've misapplied a certain rule uh, is to ha have perfect knowledge of the rule and, and to have memorized these rules. So the more knowledge you have, the, the easier your knowledge kind of autocorrect. Uh, if, if you know by heart uh, the, the rules of logic, you will be able uh, to uh, identify when a rule was misused when, in your proof. And uh, if, uh, if you have an error, at some point you'll think, why is that thing true? Why did I write this statement? It doesn't feel right. And it doesn't feel right because it contradicts your prior knowledge. So the solution to correct your, your errors in math is to... Uh, to have the knowledge about why these things might be errors, so which really means to to have memorized the, these rules and theorems, and to know uh, and, and to use your knowledge to find your errors. Yeah. Great. Um, now we will open for the uh, newest questions. Uh, we have already asked all the questions that were in the thread yesterday, so I'll invite Jake to ask the questions. Okay. You can go. Thank you, Paul. Um, the next question is from Ferris. He asked, uh, do you think it's better to memorize informal proof with words or to memorize a formal proof, for example, written uh, in Lean? Is there an advantage of memorizing formal proofs? That's a very good question. And uh, I only memorize very formal proof. And the reason for that uh, is that uh, it's true that informal proof are easier to read because uh, one of the problem with formal proof is that they use a lot of uh, specialized uh, terminology that you might not be able to read uh, quickly because it varies from mathematician to mathematician. Uh, but uh, the, the big advantage is that once you have your own terminology, it's much easier to understand what a statement is saying when it's written formally, you will. It's much quicker, and it's much quicker to see that a, a rule of logic has been applied correctly. I'm just going to give you a, a simple example. If uh, I, I uh, here's a rule uh, of logic. Uh, if P or Q is true, that P implies a statement R and Q implies a statement R, uh, then the statement R is true too. If I write this in Word, uh, it might take you a bit longer uh, to understand that the statement R is true. But if you view it symbolically, it is uh, much quicker to, to realize that. So the, the advantage of formal proof uh, is, one is that it's much quicker and easier to see that you have applied rules. It's just a simple bit of uh, uh, symbolic manipulation. You, you understand instantaneously that, that something is true. Th this will not be the case in informal proof. They, they might be easier uh, to, to read because they're less dependent on the parts of their ter terminology and you can think about them and understand that the statement is true. But uh, if I had written uh, the, the formal statement using a lot of words, uh, the, 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 the exact rule of logic uh, might take a bit longer uh, to read and to, to process. So formal proof have a lot of value as long as you're using your own language and that you're, you're uh, adept at using your language. Else, they might be harder to process. But because this is your, uh, we're discussing about your own prior, private collection of knowledge, uh, there's a lot of value to it. And... Another advantage that formal proof have is that it makes uh, what is implicit a lot more explicit. You will see much more quickly uh, why uh, there might be an error in your proof or why... Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, the next question is from Guillaume. He asks, so if uh, you don't use incremental reading for math, what about incremental problem solving using tasks and topics in SuperMemo? Um, I don't really use SuperMemo that much, so, uh, so sorry. 
Okay, so now if uh, more people want to ask questions, you can raise hand using the button here in the Discord. Um, just remember the rules uh, to ask the questions. Uh, no questions about uh, um, learning math for school and for grades. Um, and relevance mean that uh, the question was not answered before or answered in the last event. Okay. Okay, first question from Walter. Uh, let me invite you to speak. Okay, so question is, do you interleave math card into your space repetition queue with other cards from like different, like if you have say math cards, you interleave it with like like biology or something like that, or do you keep them in like separate decks or collections or whatever? So it is currently in a separate collection, but it's not really that I wanted it in a separate collection. So uh, to answer your question, uh, it is in a separate collection, but that's because I use both Super Memo and Mnemosyn. Uh, but and I place all my math question in Mnemosyn because I need the LaTeX, and uh, I use Super Memo for things that are not uh, mathematical. So uh, it's not because I believe I should have them separate. It's because I use different tools that make them separate. And I don't think they're, they're you can place all your knowledge in a single collection. Uh, I view it, I find it a bit more fun when it's just, you never know what kind of topic uh, you'll have. And uh, it's like playing a, a quiz show and it's about only quiz questions that interest you. And... Okay, if no questions, I'll ask one myself. Um, do you use uh, visuals in your math cards? I wish. Uh, I really wish I did. Uh, so most of my proof are formal. And right now, uh, part of the problem I have with visuals is that uh, the, the right way to do them might be in LaTeX. And uh, I, I'm not that much of an advanced user of LaTeX, but I do think some visuals might uh, be useful, e even in formal proof, because uh, you can represent a graph uh, very formally uh, by... Uh, Visually, but, but there are other cases in mathematics where visual is not a complete or even a correct proof. Uh, that's the, the case uh, even sometimes in Euclidean geometry where uh, what looked like a visual proof might misrepresent uh, seriously some ideas uh, and might not be a complete argument. So I would be in favor of using a visual proof and still call it a proof as long as... Uh, the, the visual uh, elements completely uh, represent uh, something that can be formalized. So in category theory, you can uh, represent some ideas through diagrams, and the diagram is a complete description of a mathematical statement. Or in graph theory, you can represent completely correctly an idea uh, by doing a drawing of the graph. And again, I, I find this acceptable. But then th there are some things that should not be considered visual proof. They're more like visual arguments, and they're less trustworthy because the the drawing doesn't really represent uh, the the idea correctly. Someone else has raised a hand. Let's yes. Uh, I'll invite GC Room to speak. Hey, so f first off, I joined a little late, so I'm sorry if this has already been stated. Um, but I was curious as to whether or not you uh, also put definitions um, in your in your cards as well as theorems and proofs. Uh, yes. Yes, and uh, I've explained that in another event, and I will uh, soon give a complete example where I show how I write the definitions. Perfect, thank you. Pleasure. Uh, maybe we should move to the free discussion? What? Yeah, let's move. Okay, guys, we'll just uh, move to general voice if you want, then we can all talk if you want. Um, just before moving, I wanted to thank you, Paul, very much for um, answering our questions and uh, also ask the people who are viewing us on YouTube to uh, consider joining our Discord community and also subscribing to Guillaume's channel. So, Thanks uh, a lot for having me. me.